Okay, maybe we should start. Is, are you ready? Uh, I guess. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are uh, very happy to have David Gaiotto today uh, with us, and uh, he will talk about vertex operators and screening charges as gauge invariant brain intersections in twisted MTU. Yeah, I'm terribly sorry. I wrote the, the title in a hurry without checking it, and it came out to be a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but I decided to keep it. Okay. Yeah. So, right, this is work done in collaboration with uh, uh, Miroslav, Miroslav uh, Rakak and uh, Jimano oh. over, the night, over the last uh, two years. Yeah. Uh, the main topic of this work is twisted M theory. And just to uh, give a very quick uh, introduction of what twisted M theory is, I think it's useful to, to use an analogy. Uh, with a uh, with a topic which might, might be more familiar to the string theorists in the audience, at least, or to mathematicians which have been uh, interacting with string theorists, uh, which is the topological strings. So top topological strings is a big subject, and it embeds inside physical string theory in a very precise way, which is you take, uh, say, type 2B string theory on a on a Calabria quantification, and you turn on what's called the self duography photon background, uh, where you, uh, which is a, essentially a, a background for the five form, which has some legs uh, in, in R4, and which are sort of like a, the wedge of a self, self dual form in R4 and of the holomorphic tree form in the Calabria. Uh, and when you do so, you can identify a protected subsector which if you think in terms of string theory is uh, the, top, the B model topological string. And if you think that's in terms of supergravity of sort of the target space physics is the BCOV theory or Kodaira Spencer theory, which is a sort of a, it's a six dimensional theory. You've lost the R4 directions. It's a, it's a theory that describes like the formations of the Calabria geometry. It's a kind of an holomorphic gravity. So it's a, it's a sort of a gravity for complex structures. The partition function of this uh, six dimensional theory computes some uh, protected quantities in the original physical theory. Namely, uh, it computes some F terms uh, in the four dimensional effective action that you get by compatifying the type two theory the, on the Calabria manifold. Uh, a slightly more modern perspective is that uh, this is an omega deformed twisted supergravity background. So I will describe what this supergravity is uh, in a later slide briefly. But the idea is that uh, you can take a Calabria times R4 and turn on a certain isometry, use a certain isometry of R4, which rotates the two planes in opposite directions uh, in such a way that the whole uh, theory localizes some configurations which are fixed by this isometry. And this is, the, this is why the 10 dimensional type should be gravity becomes a six dimensional theory. Um, as you, one of the nice features of this twisted supergravity background is that whenever you have a theory, a quantum field theory, which was coupled to the original supergravity fields, uh, if you turn on the supergravity, this twisted supergravity background, the quantum field theory gets automatically twisted as well. Uh, so, the volume theory, in particular, the volume theory that lives on brains uh, gets omega deformed and twisted and simplifies. Uh, at some point, Ogur and Waffa in particular notice that if you take uh, brains that wrap a, a cycle in the Calabiao as well as uh, a plane in R4, one of these planes rotated by the isometry, then you get. Uh, a, a brain in the topological strings. So essentially you get a, a brain that, in, that, that just lives in the Calabria. If it's space filling, uh, it, the volume theory reduces to the homomorphic transamorphic theory. Uh, so what's going on is that you started with, with, a, with a brain that was seven dimensional. It had a seven dimensional Yamil's theory in it. Uh, so eight, eight dimensional, right? Yes, six plus two, yes. Eight dimensional, it had an eight dimensional Yamil's theory. And this theory gets omega deformed and simplifies to what's called holomorphic transamos theory, 
which is a gauge theory, which depends only holomorphically on the on the on the space manifold, and has a transamons like action. Uh, although it only involves uh, the antihomotopic part of the connection. And brains of various dimensionality have various uh, work volume theories, which are obtained essentially from dimensional reduction of, uh, of holomorphic transamons theory. And you can make a lot of statements about what lives at the junctions between brains or intersections between brains, or uh, in general, develop a whole, a whole theory uh, of these brains inside Kodara Spencer theory. Um, and a remarkable fact is that there is a lot of interplay, a lot of constraints on this Kodara Spencer theory and on the brain theories. They come just from the fact that these can be coupled together. So, for example, the Kodara Spencer theory at first sight is non renormalizable. After all, it's a theory of gravity. Uh, but surprisingly, the counter terms, order by order in perturbation theory, are fixed uniquely by the requirement that this can be coupled to holomorphic and Simon's theory. This is how I understand some work done by Michael Stello and me, I think. Uh, sorry, I might get this citation wrong, so ignore what I said, but um, so um, conversely, the volume theories on the brains are very constrained by the fact that they can be coupled to the Spencer theory. Um, essentially, I think they can be uniquely determined from that uh, and from some very basic assumptions. So I find this remarkable because I mean, although not as remarkable as, okay. At first sight, these statements are almost confusing because we know that we're really talking about the B-model topological strings. And so in principle, I can use this topological string to compute uh, the effective action of, uh, of type 2B and presumably also the effective action of the Spencer theory, just doing loops in topological strings. Um, similarly, we know how to get a volume theories on the brains just because we know what lives on, on the brains in string theory. Uh, so this sort of normalization theorems seem sort of redundant. Uh, on the other hand, you can think about that as saying that the whole structure was really very rigid. Even if I did not know about topological string theory, uh, Kodara Spencer theory coupled to brains is so rigid that it's essentially uniquely determined. And if, if I did not know about the volume theory on brains, I could derive it just on the fact that it can be coupled to Kodara Spencer theory, presumably. So these observations become more striking, of course, if, in many, if I'm in a situation where I do not have string theory, meaning if I consider the twisted and theory. Uh, our ability to compute uh, the effective action of M theory is sort of limited, although there has been some very nice progress recently using conformal bootstrap and holography. Similarly, the volume theories of, of brains in M theory are rather mysterious in many ways. Um, okay, we, we think we understand that there is a 6D SCFT on the volume theory, on, on a stack of M5 brains. Uh, we have a lot of conjectural statements about this CFT. Maybe at some point we can even bootstrap it, starting from some uh, basic conjectural uh, properties. But we don't have an immediate derivation of the properties of this difference, of the of this theory. Uh, and remarkably, it seems it seems from that using these ideas of, of twisted M theory you can derive at the very least some protected subsectors of the six-dimensional theory rigorously. Um, set protected sub sectors that might be enough to then determine the whole theory through bootstrap. Um, so anyway, so when I speak about twisted and theory, I mean some uh, twisted supergravity to the ground. Again, I'll explain a bit better later what it means where space times look like the product of uh, two factors, a five-dimensional factor and a six-dimensional factor. 
And the six-dimensional factor has been omega deformed, meaning that there is an isometry. I take a U1 isometry, which rotates these three planes. Uh, do, you, do you see my mouse? You do, right? Yeah. Which rotates these three planes uh, by an amount epsilon one, epsilon two, and minus one, minus epsilon one, minus epsilon two. So that it preserves the calabial tree form. And I use this isometry to omega deform. And the result, as a result, the 11 dimensional theory is sort of reduced down to five dimensional theory. And locally, the geometry looks like R times two complex directions. Um, this began was introduced by Costello. He introduced it as a special case of a more general story, uh, which might involve, say, R times uh, a four manifold times a Calabiao, times a, or perhaps even a, a, in a complex symplectic, an upper killer for manifold times a G2 manifold with an exometer. And presumably, you know, this, this setup should have a, a lot of interesting uh, properties and structures, perhaps as rich as the one for the uh, topological string theory. Except that uh, you don't have a topological, you don't have something like the topological string theory behind it, but you have something like Kodara Spencer theory, meaning that uh, uh, Costello also uh, proposed uh, actually three dual descriptions of this uh, five dimensional theory of, comp uh, of financial system theory as a five-dimensional non-commutative Yuan Chan Simons theory, uh, which is a sort of a peculiar way to present what is a theory of uh, describing the uh, fluctuations uh, in five-dimensional manifolds, which are sort of uh, locally constant along the, the, the arc direction, which is topological, and complex symplectic along the four dimension, the, the cholomorphic directions. Um, a way to understand it intuitively is that, um, it, you know, the classical limit of a non-commutative one uh, gauge theory is essentially a theory of symplectomorphisms of C2. Uh, simply because, you know, a non-commutative C2 at the leading order is just a C2 equipped with a symplectic structure. And you can convince yourself that the gauge transformations of the one chance Simon's theory are pretty much uh, the one theory is pretty much the same as sort of locally constant complex symplectomorphisms. Of this, uh, I mean, locally constant in R complex symplectomorphisms of C2. Anyway, uh, we have this description, and Kevin also gave some normalization theorems about this theory. Uh, that essentially said that all the counter terms can be uh, reabsorbed into the redefinition of these epsilon i parameters. And uh, he also gave us some uh, statements about how n two brains and n five brains might look like in this stuff. And so I've been spending a lot of time trying to understand this proposal better and to make, uh, make it more explicit and to study the intersections between brains in this setup. Yes. How the three dual descriptions work? What are the three dual? Uh, well, I will come back to it, but very roughly, in each of these descriptions, one of the epsilon parameters is the coupling, and the other is a non commutativity parameter. So these descriptions sort of work in a, in a regime where there is a hierarchy between these parameters. Mm -hmm. Coupling is very small. The non commutativity is small, but not as small than the, as the coupling. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a bit analogous to the fact that, uh, sorry, in the, in the B type 2B setup, the omega deformation parameter essentially controls the topological string coupling. Any other questions? Okay. So, let me give some more general motivations. So why, why to study these sort of problems? Uh, the first motivation is that holomorphic twists are interesting and poorly understood. They are kind of the last unexplored frontier of 
twisting supersymmetry, supersymmetric theories. Um, they are also available uh, in situations where standard topological twists are not. I will, I will come back to this point momentarily. Uh, but there are available situations where you know, there is really interesting physics going on. And uh, it's natural to wonder if they can capture at least some of that physics. So at the moment, this homomorphic twist has been mostly studied in two dimensions. Uh, and even mathematically, the tools needed to study these holomorphic twists are still being uh, developed. Uh, so it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an interesting and subject where there is uh, the, the chance to, to, to find something new about supersymmetric theories, I think. Um, another motivation is these surprising normalization theorems that appear in twisted supergravity. So I don't understand them. Uh, it's natural to wonder if they're telling us some normalization theorems about protected quantities in the supergravity theories, in the physical supergravity theories, but I don't know exactly what. Uh, historically, we have seen that supergravity theories have very unexpected renormalization properties. Uh, I remember people working very hard to figure out if n equal h supergravity was, for example, uh, finite. And I think the, uh, the, uh, they had, people had to go up to seven or perhaps eight loops to find the potential counter term. And anyway, it is just to, you know, this was a very painful calculation. Uh, I, I may hope that using twisted supergravity, one might, might be able to do these calculations in a simpler way, or perhaps organize these results or discover new ones. Uh, I think the, the, fact, the idea that the coupling to brains might give you stronger normalization results is quite interesting. For example, I don't know, is it possible that uh, requiring the coupling of any kind of supergravity to a super particle might actually put some further constraints on, on counter terms? It's possible. Uh, so, I think this this deserves to be this point deserves to be explored further, uh, and also this to supergravity offers the chance to uh, define some exact subsectors of holography uh, by twisting both the bulk and the boundary theory, if you want. And I think this is also uh, deserves some attention. Finally, I have a weakness for vertex operator algebras and for. Uh, the surprising appearance of vertex operator algebras in supersymmetric uh, gauge theories. And this twisted and theory setup seems to be a very natural place to embed this sort of relations such as AGT and extend them further. Uh, for example, in the course of our work, we have found natural twisted and theory places for constructions such as the Coulomb gas realization of, uh, of the Azor conformal blocks. And uh, right. so this is uh, interesting, at least for me. And I think mathematically also uh, is interesting. So there are a lot of a lot of very magical algebras and very magical algebraic results and constructions uh, find a very natural place in twisted and theory. Okay. So any questions? To sort of the, the end of the motivational part of the talk. So uh, let me remind you what twisting supersymmetric theories means very briefly. So the idea is that you take a, a theory which has uh, super point asymmetry and you pick a supercharge which is important. And you just use it as a BRST charge or you add it to the BRST charge. Uh, as you do so, as usual, um, the, the path integral becomes a way to compute a simpler path integral over Q exact, Q closed conf configurations. Uh, so the theory sort of simplifies, but still captures some, some information of the original theory. Uh, 
it, a twist is called topological if all the translation symmetries are too exact. So if you plug your supercharge inside the super Poincare algebra, you can check how many translations we find on the right hand side as you vary the other supercharge. And if they are all exact, that means that the location of operators is the gauge symmetry in this new theory. So the, the you know the correlation functions are essentially independent of the position of operators. Uh, although sometimes you can get some some interesting uh, topological uh, dependence. On the other hand, uh, a twist is called holomorphic if all the anti-holomorphic derivatives are too exact, meaning that uh, now that the, the correlation functions will roughly depend on the position of operators holomorphically. Uh, these sort of twists are particularly useful if the dependence on the couplings or energy scale uh, is controllable. Or perhaps if the dependence can be determined uniquely by some algebraic structure emerging in the theory. So, as I mentioned, if you're just happy to work with holomorphic twists instead of topological twists, uh, you don't need much supersymmetry. So examples of in physical interesting theories which have admit holomorphic twists are the DN equal two theories, for DN equal one theories, and five DN equal one theories. So they, they, these theories have allow twists which um, make them depend only on say one real one topological direction, one holomorphic direction for the D, or two holomorphic directions in for D, or one topological and true holomorphic directions in 5D. And these are theories that have interesting physics, you know, they have anions, confinement, uh, mysterious V fixed points. Uh, and so it, it's I think it's fair to ask how much of this interesting physics survive uh, the twist. And, uh, and it's visible in these twisted theories. And how much how computability do we have in these twisted theories? I would like to also point out that if you're studying super conformal versions of these theories, uh, the Lomophic twist sort of usually picks out the operators which co contribute to the super conformal index. And the super conformal indices of these theories with low supersymmetry capture a lot of information. For example, in holographic setups, you can even see black hole degeneracies out of the uh, behavior of the superconformal index. And so again, there is a chance that these homomorphic twists capture something fun. Uh, twist of supergravity is a way to uh, twist gra supergravity. Uh, it's Instead of sort of by hand modifying the Beresti charge of your theory, uh, what you do following Kevin's prescription is you turn on a new potent dev for one of the super ghosts, one of the ghosts for the supersymmetry. And then you work perturbatively around this background. And you can surely ask, you know, uh, important you know, questions about the non perturbative meaning of this operation, which I don't think are uh, fully resolved. Are you going to explain what you mean by turn on an important VEF? Well, you have an action. There are ghosts and super ghosts, and the ghosts, super ghosts are bosons. And then you just take the super ghosts and you say, okay, this is equal, this equals blah plus a fluctuation, and you do perturbation theory. But the blah is nil potent. Yes. And then how do you deal with it? You just close your eyes and pretend that every time you see the square of it, you say it is zero? No, no, I mean, it's an actual function of space time. Uh, you know, it's a... But it's not a number. It's not... It, it's that is, it's a, you, you want a solution of the equations of motion. Uh, I'm, I'm asking something much more elementary. What's an important VEV? VEV is usually a number. This is something that can be measured. Well, but it's, a, it's, it's more like a spinner, right? And important typically means that some bilinear pairing involving the spinner is zero. It's okay for the bilinear, because the bilinear could be a number. Yeah. So I don't know, it's it's something similar. You can think about something like a like, like a pure spinner that you know it's a in 10 dimension, it's a spin of the square is zero. If you okay. I mean, so you're not going to explain it further. 
uh, well, I think it's actually a bit setup dependent. Uh, in the case of twisted M theory, I remember, you know, Kevin Weiss an equation where there is a pairing of this pinot with itself uh, involving some gamma matrices and you want that to be zero. Um, I think there is some, you know, some question like gamma of gamma contracted with two of these gamma, you know, gamma alpha beta v alpha v beta equal to zero for all the gammas, for all the gamma matrices, or something like that. Um, so did this answer the question? Yeah, the answer to the question is that you're not going to explain it further. <laughs> yes, it's a fair answer. Fair, fair characterization, yes. Um, it, it's definitely true that to understand better what this means uh, in relation to the physical theory, one, one has to look at these details a bit more, uh, more carefully. Um, um, David, there is another question in the chat. Okay. Um, is it possible to perform a holomorphic twist along some generic Riemann surface sigma when considering, say, 4D theory on R2 times sigma? Does sigma have to be a complex plane? I think for 4D equal one, you need to do sort of sigma times sigma prime or 4D. So it's, you get something which is holomorphic in two directions. Mm -hmm. um, Right, so in, in the case of the twisted per gravity background, uh, the twisted, twisted and theory background, as, far, as I remember, what Kevin does is to turn on a, a background uh, four form flux. And, there's, and then in the presence of this four form flux, uh, he can find a covariantly constant spinner, which squares actually not to zero, but to, to, to an isometry of, the, of this G2 manifold. So you get a, uh, omega deformed uh, theory. Uh, okay. Right, so I, I answer. So before I get to my deformation, let me just also stress this, this fact that, uh, as I mentioned, if you have a quantum field theory twisted to, to super gravity, this shift of the super ghost is precisely what results in the BRST charge of the quantum field theory being shifted by the supersymmetry charge. So your quantum field theory is automatically coupled to super gravity, automatically get twisted when they're coupled to this background. Uh, right, I mentioned omega deformation. There is a variant of this construction where you look at a VEV, uh, a supercharge, which squares to an isometry of your space time. And in that, in that situation, usually you're, you're your theory localizes to the fixed point of this uh, isometry. Uh, right, I have to confess, I, I never personally twisted a, a supergravity theory. Uh, so uh, most of what I do starts from the point of view of the already twisted theory that's, uh, that's being written down, uh, either directly or using some dualities uh, by Kevin. Uh, definitely opening the hood uh, of this construction would be an important step to understand which parts of the physical theory are captured by this twisted theory. Um, okay, so let me, there is another useful perspective on, on this uh, twisted M theory uh, background, which is that if you take M theory on a Calabria manifold, you get a five dimensional theory with n equal one supersymmetry. And so, what this twisted M theory is doing is that it's just giving you the holomorphic topological twist to this five dimensional theory. Then, when you turn on the omega deformation in the Calabiao, you deform the five dimensional theory in some way. Now, the local geometry, as I said, is R times C2. So there is a topological direction, there are two holomorphic direction. 
and there is a complex sympathetic form on C2. Uh, the sort of brains, brain probes that you can insert in this system are M2 brains wrapping a curve in the Calabial, which give you a topological line defect along the real direction, or M5 brains wrapping a surface in the Calabial, uh, you know, a two dimensional complex surface, which gives you a, a, a surface defect in R in situ, wraps a, an holomorphic plane in R in situ. Now, I should say immediately that at the moment, very little is known about the holomorphic topological twist of a gener generic five dimensional theory of a generic Calabial. Um, and these are interesting questions that I would like to really get to at some point. Uh, but for now, I've been mostly focusing to situations where there is some relatively simple uh, toric Calabial, such as uh, just C3. So as I mentioned, if you take the Calabial geometry to be C3 with the Zomagata formation, uh, you get a, a five-dimensional theory, which can be described by this uh, five-dimensional transamos action that I wrote down here. So say one of these breaks some of the symmetries at the top, uh, one of the one of the deformation parameters becomes a coupling and the other becomes a, a non-commutativity non deformation uh, parameter. And even just the fact that these three different actions or four different, six different actions I can write by permuting the epsilons give the same answer is far from obvious. Uh, for example, if you take the line of surface defects which arise from compatification of intruberance and fibrance in some of these internal uh, Cs, um, you get objects which at first sight look very different in the, in the five dimensional theory. So for example, if I take an M2 brain, I wrap it on C epsilon one or C epsilon true or C minus epsilon one minus epsilon two, I can get either a Wilson line, for, you know, an abelian Wilson line of charge one for this U1 Samus theory, and maybe a Wilson line of charge minus one, or an inst what looks like an instanton particle. The five dimensional gauge theory has an instant on charge, which is you know the integral of upper jet. And you can have particles which create uh, that charge. And when you look at the word line theories that live on this uh, on these lines, uh, you find essentially wild algebras. The for different reasons, the coupling to this bulk theory makes the two positions in. See, right, right. These, these are lines that wrap R inside R times C2. They're dynamical lines, so they have two operators on them that describe the motion in, in the two C directions. Let me call them Z1 and Z2. They're also the topological local, local operators. You can move them along the line in the form of an algebra. And for different reasons, you get a while algebra uh, with parameter epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3. And so that the final operator algebra on the line is you know, symmetric under permutation of the epsilons, although the, the original theory does not look like it. Similarly, if you get a, an M5 brain and you couple it to, the, to this theory, uh, you can argue that you get either a turf surface of charge one or minus one, or uh, a defect defined by coupling the phi D theory to a Carroll fermion. And again, when after the dust settles, the result is that the local operators that live on the fibrin uh, form a free boson vertex algebra with certain levels. Okay, but this is, uh, right, until here, everything can be done starting from a Lagrangian, right? We, if I have a single M2 brain or a single M5 brain, I know which, what are the following theories. I can omega the form them and I can see what happens. And I can compare them with the five dimensional transformal description. Things become more interesting if you have stacks of M5 brains or M2 brains. For example, if I have a stack of NM5 brains, I know it should support the six dimensional superconformal field theory with 2,0 square symmetry, coupled to, and we, which is coupled to this 11 dimensional supergravity. 
Now, uh, even that the you know, describing these couplings in the full physical theory uh, would be an interesting and tricky job, right? Uh, there will be probably some all sort of high derivative couplings where the where the spectrality fields couple to certain operators of the CFT. And uh, you know, gauge invariance of these couplings would probably involve complicated calculations constraining the OPE of these local operators, among other things. Now, after you topologically twist the number of the form, uh, this six dimensional CFT is supposed to give us a W algebra. You know, one of the uh, ugly cousins of the Viazo algebra. Um, and uh, this is basically the, the underlying origin for the AGT correspondence. And so now you can ask, is it possible to couple this W algebra in a gauge invariant way to the uh, Fidich and Simons theory? And you know, this was, you know, Kevin started looking at this problem and we looked at this problem further. And um, there is a very powerful te technology introduced by Kevin called causal duality which allows to express these gauge invariant couplings as a morphism of algebras. Essentially, you, 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 you learn that if I have a surface defect with some volume algebra V, and I want to couple it to the twisted supergravity, uh, this coupling is expressed by a vertex algebra map from a universal vertex algebra called W infinity to my vertex algebra. And the OPEs and structure of this W infinity uh, capture all sort of Feynman diagram calculations in the five dimensional transcendence theory. Uh, a, a way to think about it is this W infinity is sort of the local, the algebra of local cons gauge, cons of gauge constraints, local gauge constraints near your surface defect. And it tells you this, this this morphism tells you how a certain bulk gauge transformation acts within your uh, volume theory. In a sense, this the image of this with infinity are the currents for the gauge symmetries of the bulk. And well, uh, it just so happens that there is indeed a map from W infinity to WN. Indeed, W infinity can be defined as the larger limit of WN. Um, and you can ask what sort of vertex algebras can receive a map from W infinity. Uh, in particular, you can look at, at truncations of W infinity, sort of quotients of W infinity, which are available when some parameters are tuned. And you reco re recover the corner vertex algebras, which uh, I introduced with uh, Miro's lab to describe uh, precisely what happens if I have three stacks of M5 brains uh, meeting within a certain uh, color within C3. So see the most general surface defect you can get by wrapping an M5 brain on this, a stack of M5 brains on this, on, on this surface, a stack of M5 brains on this surface, and another stack of M5 brains on the product of these two Cs. I can take these three stack of frames and just put them all on the same surface in R times C2. And this will give me some very complicated surface defect, um, which we uh, computed from duality should support a certain vertex algebra we call the corner vertex algebra. And at the time we were observing, oh, this corner vertex algebra kind of looks like it's related to W infinity, but it wasn't quite clear why. And now this twisted interior perspective tells you that this cap, this relation is precisely what's needed to for these fibers to meet a coupling to uh, supergravity for this junction for this intersection of fibers to meet a coupling to supergravity. Now, um, you might wonder if it's possible to reconstruct the theory that lives on NM5 brains by just bringing together multiple NM5 brains. Uh, if there is a fusion operation that allows you to bring together uh, individual NM5 brains. 
And indeed, this, this, this sort of holomorphic topological setup predicts that there should be a coproduct of sort, which allows you to combine the vertex algebras living on the two defects with the vertex algebra that lives on their pro, on their fusion. Um, because on each individual and five points, you find a free boson. Uh, this construction actually matches the free field realization of vertex algebras, of, of W algebras, where Wn is built out of N free bosons. Uh, this free field realization is a, is a piece of a more general construction called the Coulomb gas construction, where you build the conformal blocks of Wn out of conformal blocks of free bosons with the insertion of some auxiliary screening charges, which are integrated along your along contours on your, on your human surface. And we found, and I perhaps managed to briefly mention something about it later on, we did find a very natural physical uh, interpretation of these screening charges, a sort of segments of M2 brains stretched between the five brains. Um, and sort of we, we could give a physical reason for which these uh, screening charges should exist and commute with the W algebra generators as they should. So, you know, a very important vertex algebra construction emerges quite naturally from the, from the distant theory setup. Um, any questions? Sorry, I, are the questions in the chat or? Yes, there are a couple of questions which go back. So one question is, um, is, the, is this uh, non-commutative Chern Simons theory um, uh, a theory of some five D analogs of complex structure deformation, CR structures? Maybe? Yes, so uh, I, I, as far as I understand, it describes locally constant uh, complex inflective structures. So the complex inflective structure in situ, which is locally constant along the, the real direction. But we definitely love to understand better which kind of five manifolds can be involved in this situation. Uh, in particular, I've been struggling to find uh, uh, a proper holography construction involving twisted and theory. And part of what the challenge is precisely that I don't know uh, which five manifolds I can work with, which structures do I need to put on five manifolds to define this theory. So I want to put Essentially, I want to put this theory in something that looks like it is two times S3, but I'm not quite sure how to put this real holomorphic symplectic structure on it is two times S3, or it is three times S2, depending on which holography you're doing. Another question? Another question is whether the, the VEV you mentioned to the mm -hmm. super ghost, is it gauge, uh, it, it is done in certain gauge, and it, does it depend on the gauge? or? In which gauge are you working um, under the hood? I'm not sure. I'm not looked. <laughs> and, and finally, why does fusion give a um, co-product rather than a product? Aha! Uh -huh. It's because of this uh, causal duality. Uh, but a way you can uh, think about it is that. Right, so the, gener the image of this W infinity inside your volume theory tells you which operators are coupled to certain bulk, certain modes of the bulk field. If I now take these surface defects close to each other and I look at, try to figure out, no, I compute Feynman diagrams to see what does a certain bulk field couple to, these Feynman diagrams will have legs which land on both defects. And so what does my bulk operator couples to becomes essentially bilinear of, uh, of local operators on the two defects. So that's why you get a co-product. Right. And then, you know, associativity of this co-product is, so here I'm considered, I should mention, I consider fusion along the real direction of surfaces wrapping one of the complex directions. Almost everything I've done uh, until now involves only one, only the real direction and one complex direction. 
there is probably more going on that involves both compass directions at the same time, but it's a bit beyond my abilities at the moment. Um, okay. Now, a similar story can be formulated about M2 grains. Uh, again, M2 grains wrap, a start of M2 grains wraps, supports a three dimensional super conformal field theory. Um, after omega deformation, this becomes a, an algebra, a topological algebra, which uh, is in, in the particular case of the N2 brains, uh, can be given a variety of names. It's the quantization of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints. It's also called the spherical Hecke algebra, I think. It has a variety of presentations. Uh, one way you can think about it is that. Uh, you can you can take the calogero Hamiltonian describing the motion of n particles, uh, and take the symmetric polynomials in these n part in these n positions, and just take commutators of these two things. This infinite, this infinite collection of symmetric polynomials and the calogero Hamiltonian, and you get a variety of operators, uh, differential operators of all possible degrees. Uh, Many of which actually happen to commute with each other and to give the high Hamiltonian to so the Calogero model. Uh, the whole algebra of these operators is, is this spherical Hecker algebra. Anyway, the causal duality statement controlling the coupling of line defects to uh, twisted theory is that now there is an algebra map from some universal algebra, which I'll just call A, to whatever algebra lives on your. Uh, on your defect. And again, so Kevin reconstructed this algebra A essentially by saying, by taking the large n limit of this very collective algebra, okay, okay, algebras. And now you can again ask what happens if I take three stacks of M2 brains? If I take some M2 brains wrapping the first factor, some wrapping the second, some wrapping the third. So I get a line defect at the intersection of these 3D theories. Um, you know, is there some analog of these corner vertex algebras? And in the last work with, uh, with Miro's lab, we did indeed manage to find uh, this three stack algebra. Some kind of the generalization of the Calogera or the Calogero integral system. And we found it by figuring out how the coproduct looks like that controls the fusion of line defects. It's more subtle is that the fusion happens now in an holomorphic direction. So it's more like an OPE than a, than a fusion. I mean, it really depends on the, there is a certain residual dependence on the, on the position. The, if you want the fusion becomes singular if you, as a singular dependence on the, on the transverse direction. Um, anyway, uh, so we, we found some, some nice story there. Um, the part that was more interesting was to figure out what are the constraints on, on junctions between M2 brains and M5 brains. Uh, we, got, I mean, it, we, we just had to understand even just algebraically, how do we describe the gauge invariance condition in such a setup? So I have some algebra of local operators on a, on a line, some algebra of local operators on the other line, they come together in some point where there are some operators which admit an action of both algebras. And then there is also a surface defect with, their with the vertex of their algebra. And this point is also a vertex algebra module. So it, it has OPEs with the operators on the surface. And now I would like to find which conditions on these local operators guarantee gauge invariance. And we found that you could encode this gauge invariance in the, using a, some kind of a mixed coproduct that um, mixes together the, the universal algebras in the real and homomorphic directions. Essentially, the point is that the gauge invariance looks like this. I do a gauge transformation. I get some contribution from, so naively, I just get contributions from, uh, so suppose I, no, I integrate a gauge current uh, on, on a sphere surrounding the point. 
they will only get the contribution from where the sphere intersects the lines and the surface. So naively, the gauge, the gauge invariance condition would look like something like the gauge generators on this line equals the gauge generator on this line plus the gauge generator integrated on the circle. And some modes of the W algebra. In practice, because of Feynman diagrams in the, in the bulk, uh, the condition gets deformed a bit into something nonlinear. So the final condition, it looks like the action of some operator from the bottom equals some sum of bilinears of the action of the operators on the top and from the, and from the complex surface. Anyway, so we, we found the correct algebraic structure. Uh, at some point, somebody will figure out how Kuzul Dwadik looks like for the whole uh, setup and, and tell us it is really mathematically the right thing to do too. Uh, at the moment, Kuzul Dwadik is only sort of understood one direction at a time and mixing the real and the holomorphic direction is still a little bit uh, beyond that. But anyway, a consistent story. And more importantly, uh, we found that with this definition, we have all the junctions which you expected to have physically. So from various constructions, including HT, uh, we expected that M2 brains can end on M5 brains on very specific vertex operators called degenerate vertex operators. They are the ones that for the result satisfy the DPZ uh, differential equation. Uh, also, we had reason to suspect that an M2 brain crossing an M5 brain would do so at something called uh, a mu operator, which I'm not going to describe now, but uh, it's an, another very uh, basic element in the theory of vertex of, of W algebras. And what we managed to show was that indeed all of these three do satisfy these gauge invariant constraints. So uh, these expectations from AGT or conjectures are all consistent with the uh, twisted M theory setup. Uh, furthermore, once, once you uh, embed these elementary vertex algebra objects, inside this, this higher dimensional picture, uh, you get a variety of new insights on the, on the properties of these objects. Uh, so as I mentioned, things like the Klumgar construction or the Mura transform uh, that really is used to define W algebras, uh, the construction of calogical wave functions using vertex algebras and more, all of these, can be understood from very basic, almost graphical manipulations of surface defects, line defects, and their junctions. So that, that's essentially the content of my, my last paper with uh, Miroslav. Um, okay, so let me just describe what are the possible uh, steps forward to places to go after this. Now that we have a reasonable understanding of the algebraic structure, at least for R times C, uh, we can move on to more difficult problems. One that is still a bit confusing to me is how to deal with things that wrap different, that different surfaces in situ that I don't really have a good idea how to, how to discuss. Um, a very, a very two sort of basic ways to modify the setup are to change the Calabiao or to change the five dimensional geometry. So for example, if you change the five dimensional geometry to R times C star times C star, we believe that you can find the Q deformation of all of this uh, story. There is a big confusing literature on Q deform W infinity and uh, uh, see, you know, intertwiners for this theory and uh, all sort of very nice combinatorial work, which is very mysterious to me and which pops out in a lot of situations from refined topological strings to, uh, I don't know, the, uh, well, yeah, mostly for refined topological strings, I have to say. 
but also yeah, in the theory of Donaldson Thomas invariance or Panarikhtane Thomas invariance. In, uh, in any case, I, I think that just by looking at this background, R times C star times C star, a lot of properties of this pseudo form reflex algebra should become transparent. Uh, changing the Tori Calabiao changes the vertex algebra, so algebra that we are discussing. Um, something which we feel we more or less understand already are situations that Tori Calabiao has no faces, no, no, face, no, no, no compact surfaces, meaning, uh, sorry, I thought I could annotate. Maybe I'll do it later. Um, things like, you know, instead of C3, you could use the conifold, for example. Uh, those situations, as, as I say, we think we more or less understand they are going to give us matrix generalizations of W algebras, spin calodular models, and things like that. Uh, the thing I really hope to crack is situations where the Calabial has compact surfaces. Um, so, because those Calabials begin you know actually you know actually engineer interesting five dimensional gauge theories for example if i if we could work out those calabias we could learn things about the lomorphic topological twist of pure su gauge theory in five dimension um, also another thing i would like to understand better is how to add interfaces to the story things that modify a whole su shoe at a point in the real direction because these interfaces uh, will essentially support the topological twist of four dimensional n equal one objects. So my, my long term plan, if you want, is to sort of learn how to learn what are the basic building blocks of these holomorphic topological theories, and then try to assemble them into more complicated uh, setups, more complicated internal geometries, until we can get to the point where we're telling something new about Five dimensional gauge theories about four dimensional gauge theories. I don't know if this is actually going to work, but uh, that that is the that is the goal. We're done. Thank you very much. Let's thank David for very nice talk. Are there any questions? Um, I have a question. May I? Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, it's a, a naive question. So um, characters of W algebras are uh, mock modular forms or uh, false theta functions. Yes. Um, when you associate uh, with the, when you produce a W algebra from a 6D superconformal field theory, mm -hmm. what do the coefficients of the character of the W algebra mean for 6D CFD? Are they counting something there? Yeah, there is an holomorphic, there is a superconformal index of uh, 6D sigma zero theories. Uh -huh. uh, and if you specialize the parameters of the superconformal index, you can mm -hmm. get the character of the W algebra. Now, okay. in the superconformal index geometry, there is no reason to expect a symmetry between S1 and S5. Mm -hmm. So the, the modular properties of the character of the W algebra are rather mysterious from that point of view. I see. It, I'm really very curious, both in this situation and the situation of the Carl algebra for the unique of four superior meals, of what the, what the modular properties of these uh, characters have to do with uh, sort of the simplified geometry of the twisted theory. So for example, so when, when you study this scalar algebra on T2, mm -hmm. uh, presumably there's an holographic dual calculation in twisted supergravity involving perhaps the boundary of ADS3 times S2. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not, not, quite, not quite know how to put the five dimensional theory in ADS3 times S2, but in that setup, one might hope to understand the modularity mm. properties. Uh, Ooh, thanks. Young Chao, do you want to ask the question? Okay. 
There is a question in the chat, very speculative question and comment. Could one expect or before this background? So to get even W algebras or more exotic W algebras without the degree two generators on the integrable systems, there might be collagen mother system attached to complex reflection groups. Well, so if you take, uh, if you take say C times, no. yes. So if you take, uh, if you replace uh, C3, sorry, you replace C3 with C times NAD singularity, let, let's just say an A, A type singularity, uh, then you get, instead of a U1 transamos theory, you get a UK transamos theory. Uh, we are looking at the problem at the moment, but it seems like the algebra has to do with spin collagen models. And uh, the vertex algebra has to do with the, um, the, the sort of U, UK generalization of W infinity, sometimes called WK plus infinity. David, it may be a related question. Like the Calogero model that you find, is it related to, well, it's a limit of Ruizener Schneider model that you find when studying defects in 4D. So is it, uh, do you yeah, see so, a direct relation? Or? Yes. So if you look at R times C star times C star, uh, then uh, right, the Calogero model gets deformed to something which is to the relativistic rational version, mm -hmm. uh, which is not the more general RS. It's not elliptic RS, but it's trigon trigonometric RS, I think, which I think it is. I forget, sorry, the moment I a moment of, is this the same as McDonald? McDonald? Uh, it is uh, McDonald, yes. Yes, yes. So I know that the, so the cuneiform story should involve the McDonald difference operators. I see. And uh, the generalizations of the integrable models you found, do they have any like 4D analogs? Like the ZK or before that you mentioned, like if you look Mm -hmm. on M5 brains probing ZK singularity, and you can introduce defects in the index in 4D. Is it related uh, to any structures? Uh, so now you want to put the AK singularity in space time in the C2, yes. right? Uh, I'm really curious about that, but I'm confused too. So at the moment, I understand the M2 brains in that setup, but not yet the M5 brains. I see. I mean, they don't wrap C anymore. They wrap some, some, some surface inside uh, the AK singularity. I see. And but I just see. algebraically, I've not understood quite well. I see. And, uh, and maybe any other like simpler background, like something like an E string, like M5, in, like putting a M9 brain somewhere in this setup. Right, I, I've been confused by that. Uh, so I do not know if the end of the world brain is compatible with the twisted uh, M theory. I did hope so. I was I was really hoping that I could. Uh, I know, I, as I mentioned, I you know you, you I, I'm hoping to find interfaces or boundary conditions that sort of, instead of having R, I can have R plus, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that the end of the world brain can, can be used for that purpose. Um, probably not because the, the E8 string, like this, the 60 1,0 theories, I do not think are compatible with Omega the ground. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to suggest no. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm wondering if, sorry, I just wanted to know what's known about uh, homomorphic twists of 40n equals one. Is that a tractable problem on its own? I think it's definitely tractable. I, I think three theories have been described. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I haven't seen calculations in tracking theories, but I might have missed them. 
So are there any conjectures about what the local up, what the cohomology is? Uh, so let's say in pure uh, n equals one Yang Mills? I don't think so. Okay. And that's an interesting problem. I probably have some slides too if needed, but uh, I'm not sure this is the right time uh, to show them. Uh, but right, the, there is a question also which sort of algebraic structures uh, are computable and uh, capture this homomorphic twist. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a an analog of an L infinity. So if you were doing to, two dimensional topological uh, field theories, mm -hmm. which is only sort of the Kaluza Klein reduction of the 4D theory and torus, then the bulk operators would have an L infinity structure uh, where which is given by so you have a bunch of operations where you take one operator you do a, apply one or more operators you apply these same relations and you integrate them on some cycles around each other right uh, so there is an analog of that in these holomorphic theories mm -hmm. where you take a bunch of operators you apply descent uh, but this descent only gives you, gives you antilomorphic directions now antilomorphic mm -hmm. forms so you need to wedge them with some holomorphic forms on configuration space and integrate. It's some, some, some kind of a L infinity version of the vertex algebra. Right, right. It's some huge tower of operations and I have no clue of which answer these are, are non-trivial or interesting uh, because they involve operations where the points never touch and you integrate on some cycles whose size can be changed at the price of quasi-isomorphisms of your algebra. I think there is a good chance that these algebraic objects are RG flow covariant. Uh, I see, yeah. And you expect this uh, conjectural structure, uh, L infinity, so this chiral version of an E2 algebra to. Yes, yes. To be the, so the chiral uh, algebra, we have operations now labeled by Dalbo homology of configuration space of points. Hmm. And okay. I, I mean, mathematicians can surely define it abstractly. And uh, I'm not sure how much concrete calculations have been done. Uh, mm, okay, very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in Shudi, right, there is this this web algebra story that I developed with uh, uh, Greg and Edward, where mm -hmm. you know we we claim that the L infinity algebras, for example, in the Urian they are quasi isomorphic, and if your theory is gapped, you can compute the algebra in the infrared uh, using webs of BPS particles. I can right. dream that perhaps there is a similar quasi-isomorphism in, in gap for the equal one theories, where somehow yeah, something I mean, computed so. in the UV can be computed in the IR by some webs of BPS strings, uh, right. domain right. walls. Hmm. But it's very speculative. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean certainly there's a some formal analogies between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Very interesting. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Davide again. And uh, we can maybe stop the recording in case people want to ask embarrassing questions.